This week on the show, as our weather becomes wilder due to climate change, we look at the government's latest plans to reach net zero, which include sucking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Something under the waves here could help with that. And welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. This week, I'm in Sussex, where later in the programme, we'll be looking at how a nature recovery beneath the waves here is not only good for wildlife, but could help climate too. But first, it's all about Green Day. Not the pop-punk legends of the early 2000s, but the government's plans to reach net zero by 2050, which were revealed on Thursday. So, what did they say and how did we get here? Thursday was supposed to be the day Rishi Sunak updated the world on how Britain will reach net zero by 2050. Today we're announcing more investment in renewables like offshore wind, reviving the nuclear industry, developing new industries like carbon capture and storage. And as we deliver on that, we're going to create jobs across the country, we're going to increase our energy security, reduce people's bills and reduce our carbon emissions. It was originally called Green Day, but was rebranded to Energy Security Day, which raised a few eyebrows in the climate world. The government released a huge number of documents for the day, totalling over 2,800 pages of work, but many said the announcements still fell well short of what's needed. There's a lot left to be desired by today's plans um, and the renewables industry, as an investor, you're going to look at the UK and look at it in the context of what the US are offering, the EU are offering, and you might just choose to go there instead. Last year, the High Court ruled the government's net zero strategy unlawful and Joe Biden published far-reaching green plans to encourage US business to grow in a more sustainable way. The Inflation Reduction Act uh, represents the most significant pro-climate legislation ever passed by any nation in all of history. And in January, ex-Energy Minister Chris Skidmore released Mission Zero, a wide-reaching review of how net zero plans and businesses could help each other in the UK. I've tried to recast net zero, not as an environmental measure, but as an economic one. Thursday's announcements were supposed to be an answer to all three of those events. Well, to talk about what was billed as Green Day, colours didn't turn out to be that vivid in the end. I'm joined by Sky's energy and climate correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, in Sky's electric vehicle charging bay. Hannah, was it brand new vehicles, brand new stuff, or was it a bit of a respray of things we've seen before? Well, it's actually interesting because one of the few new ideas came from the Department uh, for Transport, who proposed this consultation on giving a mandate to vehicle manufacturers to make increasing numbers of electric vehicles, and there was some new money made available to increase the EV charging infrastructure. Roughly how much? Uh, it was about 300 million for local charging and residential charging. But there, the newness ends. The immediate criticism was, this is just reheated policy, already announced stuff coming out, you're packaging it in this shiny wrapping paper, and that's what I asked Energy Secretary Grant Shapps about. Is there any new money? in the set of policies? Ah, there is money that is new in it. For example, uh, we are extending today uh, the scheme which enables people to fit heat pumps into their homes. And there's a lot of other money. You say, I mean, look, I'm not particularly defensive about this. I think it's a good thing to, to sort of define the money that you're going to spend and, and lay out the detail of those policies. So he was broadly admitting there wasn't much new in the showroom here. One of the things he's very keen about still is carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and utilisation. This idea that we can capture the carbon dioxide and somehow lock it up, keep it away from the atmosphere. Yeah, and in the budget they announced £20 billion over the coming few decades to have a real go at carbon capture and storage. Let's just be really clear, it's, it's relatively untested. We know the technology works, but it's not available or affordable at scale. 
the thing that the government really likes about it, actually, is that it could support tens of thousands of new jobs. And they did say that they're going to concentrate this effort in the industrial heartland clusters in the north, northeast, northwest, a Teesside near Liverpool, and, and so on. So that's why they're pushing on it. And of course, oil and gas are keen on it too, because it allows them to keep using their core product while they reduce the harm of it. And I did press Grant Shapps on that issue. People are already capturing carbon. We know that can work. I agree there's a big difference between doing that and storing 78 tonnes, billion tonnes of it, you know, uh, under, under, under the sea in the North Sea. But if we can make that work, then there's a massive export opportunity to us, probably bigger than oil and gas was in the first place. Very clearly not an open wallet shelling out money. And a lot of people are contrasting that to what's been happening in, in America. Many more subsidies there. A lot of talk about that happening in Europe. Is there a danger of us kind of losing a lot of these green jobs, green technologies? Yes. I mean, bluntly, yeah, ex exa exactly that. And, you know, you're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which um, President Joe Biden passed. 370 billion US dollars to attract a clean tech investment to the US, to make it a clean energy superpower. The EU has responded in kind. The renewables industry in the UK has been so worried about this. And they've been asking for much more favourable tax environment so that they can keep all of their investment and efforts here. We've been leading on wind for a decade and a half. They're starting to make noises that these big projects might be on the line that are, that are coming down, down the track. But is this just the case that they see another chance to get their snouts in the subsidy trough? I mean, renewable energies love a subsidy environment, don't they? Who wouldn't? <laughs> who, was, who wouldn't? It's, it's free money. I did ask a senior source at a big wind farm developer whether there was enough to make them excited in Green Day and I got a shrug emoji back. Right, so yeah, not much there. So <laughs> there's a bit of work to do there between the, re the relationship between the government and, and big wind farm operators. I love the fact that leaks and scoops these days come in the form of emojis. They do. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice. Uh, now the climate change announcements this week were triggered by the danger of a legal challenge. There was a legal challenge. They said they had to come up with a, a sufficient plan by the end of this month. Have they done enough or might they end up in court? Oh, it's a good question. So yeah, this is Friends of the Earth and legal allies forced this additional detail from the government and by the end of March. So they were right up against the deadline. And actually, once you got into the detail of the government's documents, you kind of admitted yesterday that even with nearly 3,000 pages and 70 separate policies, they were still going to fall slightly short. By, they actually admitted that? Yeah, just by a couple of percentage points. And but a miss is a miss. <laughs> I, I, exactly right. Now, you know, Grant Shapps did kind of give me some reassurances that the plan was to hit the targets, but then he said, you know, everything's in touching distance. Can you promise the British public that these plans will deliver net zero by 2050 while also guaranteeing security of supply? Yes, that's a exactly the plan and the reason that I'm confident about this is I have more stake in this than pretty much anyone else and that's because the Secretary of State is personally required by law to get us to net zero by 2050. That's not a matter of sort of it would be quite nice to do. The ultimate sanction is that the Secretary of State can go to prison. I think that's the first time I've heard a minister admit to being a potential future jailbird. <laughs> Hannah Thomas-Peter, thank you very much indeed. Thanks Tom. A very useful breakdown from Hannah there, which I'm going to put to Chris Skidmore, who was Conservative Energy Minister, but also wrote the government's Mission Zero review at their own request. Chris, welcome. Something that slightly perplexes me, you say that you've spoken to business folk and they say net zero is a business opportunity. The Conservative Party claims to be the party of business. Why is this so underpowered? Well, I think uh, the government's uh, response to my Mission Zero report this week you know, has demonstrated that they want to power ahead. Uh, it's just that they haven't got any new money, uh, new investment, uh, and the decision to wait also uh, for a response from the US's Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I think is regrettable because um, you know, time is also money. Uh, and when we look at investors, now they will be making business decisions about whether to come to the UK, come to the United States, come to Europe. And we needed that sort of policy certainty and, and a big bang moment, I think, as I called it in the review. And I'm not quite sure we had more of a sort of damp fizzle 
uh, as a result of the response uh, this week. Uh, I just only hope that you know we will recognise the economic opportunity that net zero provides. But that hasn't been recognised yet, it seems to me, not really in government. Well, I think compared to where I was three years ago, you know, when the Treasury wasn't so pro net zero, I think the Treasury now recognised that net zero is the future economy of the UK. They just seem to want to be able to sort of like sit back and wait for what the EU is going to do before maybe coming forward with their trump card. Uh, that's my hope. And that risks losing a lot of business, doesn't it? And losing a, a position we've got here. I mean, it, it feels like they see it more as obligation than opportunity at the moment. I think the other challenge is, is not to sort of talk down the Inflation Reduction Act because, you know, we're not going to match... Which match the Chancellor did, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, and I think that was regrettable because ultimately they're our closest allies. They are democratically like-minded in terms of thinking about the future special relationship. It could be a future green special relationship where we can work together in the slipstream of the Inflation Reduction Act. And I hope that you know, when Joe Biden comes to the UK later this um, in April, this month, that uh, we might be able to look at how we can form some kind of partnership around net zero. Yeah. And just where I started about... I about being perplexed. You say they haven't done this because of lack of money, but there are some things they could have done which don't require money. They're signals, you know, onshore wind. Why not a signal from the centre that that was going to be more welcome, more encouraged? Rooftop solar, something that you specifically asked for. Once again, we didn't hear anything on that. These aren't big financial things from the centre. Why didn't they do them? No, I think you're right. There is a missed opportunity. Uh, there were some real positives uh, there for me on rebalancing gas and electricity prices, continuing to set out pathways on the vehicle mandate, you know, recognising uh, the opportunity for solar, uh, maybe not on rooftops, but it's creating a new solar task force that would work towards 70 gigawatts of deployment by 2035. So, yes, there were some measures. It was a bit hokey-cokey, half in, half out, if I'm honest with you. you know, having just done a 340-page review, I sort of feel... Everyone's sick of doing reviews and consultations. They just want to get on with the job. Also, they've basically admitted that this doesn't add up yet to reaching net zero. There's a paper out towards the end of yesterday. This is a legal obligation, as Grant Chatz has actually said. You know, uh, he could end up in jail. Should he be, should he be getting ready his, uh, his, his prison uniform? Well, yeah, that's right. 92% of our NDC target by 2030. And I said in the Commons yesterday, net zero is not about... 2050. It is about 2030. Seven years to go. It's not, you know, can't kick the can down the road thinking, oh, this is 28 years until we've got to achieve it, which is why it's so important that we deploy technologies you know, of today. You know, the challenge is always you know, the, the politicians of today are gone by tomorrow when actually we need to create climate frameworks that mean that people are held accountable today. Chris Gidmore, thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, one area of our economy and industry that will be very tough to decarbonise is steel production. It's not just the energy involved, but the fact that it uses coking coal. But our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, has been looking at a potential sustainable future for steel in the UK. Now, outside it's about five degrees, but in here it's toasty warm because this bubbling cauldron, a ladle as it's called, uh, of steel is about 1,600 degrees maybe right now. That has just come out, it's been created by an electric arc furnace, which is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Basically bolts of lightning, man-made bolts of lightning turning solid steel into molten metal. It's just crazy and the noise of it is extraordinary, which is why we've had to come here to, to, to film this bit. Now, that is potentially going off to become part of a car in the future. The kinds of steels here that they make are pretty high quality. Um, and it's quite rare, actually, for people to get access into here. We're the first people in many years to be able to film inside of, uh, of this place. But it's a really significant place because there aren't many electric arc furnaces around in the UK, those things creating a thunderstorm that, that makes steel. And electric arc furnaces may well be something that's really important for the future of this business. Why? Because when you're creating steel from iron through a blast furnace, that creates an incredible amount of carbon. This produces far, far less because you're using electricity for the most part. And so for a lot of people, this is the greener steel that we have in this country. And we need more of these electric arc furnaces in the future. The problem, um, I should say that's still created by electric arc furnace. The problem is that it takes an extraordinary amount of power to make that lightning storm that turns that steel into molten metal. 
And then you get into the issue that in the UK we have really high power costs. So if you're going to be trying to persuade blast furnaces to turn into electric arc furnaces, therefore making our steel industry far more green, well, then you encounter the issue that we have really high electricity costs, which makes it, well, if not challenging, then certainly for someone trying to build one of these things, basically impossible. So it is not simple. But this is part of the debate that we're going through right now in this country to create a steel industry that is greener than the one we have at the moment. After the break, I'll be looking at kelp, that massive seaweed that used to grow in great forests offshore here. So what's being done to restore it? Welcome back. Now, many of you will be familiar with white cliffs around parts of our coast. What you probably don't know is the whole country used to be ringed by a forest of seaweed. It was a great habitat for wildlife and stored a lot of carbon. In recent years, it's got a bit pummeled by fishing and also pollution. But now, as I've been seeing here in Sussex, there are attempts to bring it back. Just offshore, beneath the waves, something is rising from the seabed. Kelp once dominated the shallow seas around our coast, providing both a nursery and a haven for so much marine life. But a combination of fishing pressure and pollution have decimated its realm. Here in Sussex, just fragments remain. We've been left with only 3-4% of our original kelp habitat. When you get down to an area that small, it's really important that we look after what we've got and that it is thriving. Two years ago, 300 square kilometres of seabed was ruled out of bounds for bottom trawling, a type of fishing, often for scallops, that scrapes the sea floor. That added to an existing ban on dredging and bigger vessels. Boats like these, quayside in shore and port, are barred. It's enforced by the Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority. The boat with the orange hull actually yeah. is a very small scallop dredger. That wouldn't, so that wouldn't be allowed to fish within that area. The purpose of the zone is to really ensure that the habitats in those areas can develop and, and be as abundant and, and, and support as much life as possible. Large elements of the industry were very supportive. The trawling sector has been very compliant with the regulation. You know, by protecting these areas, that will benefit the fisheries outside those zones. But kelp and other seafloor life are threatened by something else, at once obvious and stealthy. The sea is getting cloudier, murkier, with less visibility for divers and sunlight for plants. Back on dry land, Marianne Glascott analyses these threats in her lab. Yeah, is it all right to open it up? Absolutely. Oh, look, it's very blue in there. Very. The blue light uh, accelerates the growth. Well, tell me, what are these other pressures that kelp is under in this area? Well, we've got a lot of what we call coastal darkening in terms of increased sediments coming down rivers. Suspended sediment in the coastal area is what makes the water look grey when you look out to sea. But much of that is actually coming down our rivers and through our aquifers and wouldn't naturally have occurred if we still had rivers meandering and, and dropping their, their silt and their sediment load on floodplains. So has the channel got murkier in recent years? Yes. Kelp and other seaweeds capture carbon dioxide dissolved in seawater. So, just like trees, their growth helps to slow global warming. And promoting its growth is a global quest. It's more productive, we believe, than the majority of trees and forests. It is hugely significant and it's at least sort of 70 tonnes per hectare per year um, in a typical kelp forest. And other species thrive in this rewilding of the ocean floor? The divers are reporting as a huge expanse of mussel beds that is now forming on the seabed, which never had a chance to develop before when we had trawling in place. Last year, these mussel beds, which was the first time they were seen, were about the size of a tennis court. This year, they were a kilometre in width. Kelp recovery, alongside thriving coastal ecosystems, aren't just important for the UK. They can help worldwide by purifying water, regulating ocean acidity, releasing oxygen and slowing erosion. But delivering that demands reducing pollution and fishing pressure. 
Now, at this time of the year, Muslims celebrate Ramadan, involving a fast from dawn till dusk. But when that fast is broken, particularly at the mosque, it often involves using an awful lot of plastic in the form of bottles, cutlery and plates. And now some within the community are calling for a plastic-free Ramadan. Allah has created a perfectly balanced world on the basis of sustainability. This balance must be maintained by man, acting thoughtfully and justly. Ramadan is often a time when people reflect and make changes to improve their lives and those around them. Our aim is to encourage all Muslims in Bristol to consider using sustainable methods to conduct iftar activity this Ramadan. On 20th of January this year, we held a workshop at the House of Lords. 18 mosques have participated in the workshop. Since we started this campaign, our community is learning to understand the importance of plastic pollution and how dangerous it is to us and to our planet. The Plastic Free Campaign shows how you can make a difference yourself. No step is too small, everyone is important. By doing this small step, by bringing your own utensils, by contributing to a mosque water source, you are actually helping to stop this plastic pollution increasing. Last week on the show, we met the adventurer Sasha Dench, who's following the migration of ospreys all the way from Guinea in West Africa to back here in the UK. Some may be coming in across the south coast as I speak. Well, now she's been to the Rio Pongo, close to the Senegal border, and sent us this. So the team and I have now set off on our expedition following the return journey of the Ospreys from West Africa. And we had to start with a trip to a town called Boffa. And it's near to there where a famous bird called uh, 4K uh, is one that we managed to track down previously with the help of local villagers and the conservation department. They come in, 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 in the day fall, because we really search for an oiseau, it's not easy to find it. But the day we found it, it was really on était contact. C'était une surprise pour moi. Now you probably noticed that many of our partners are wearing military uniforms and that is because in this part of the world and in fact many parts of Africa the original priorities for conservation were anti-poaching. We've heard from locals that actually hunting could even be an issue for a bird like the osprey. Osprey! 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 Whilst hunting has been the focus of conservation efforts in the past, that is rapidly shifting towards climate change, particularly due to the drop in rainfall in this part of Africa. And so we went to visit a group who are busy trying to focus on this, in particular through reforestation projects. Ça c'est notre site de pépinière. C'est ici nous allons préparer les plans futurs pour le reboisement. C'est ça le pépinière, les plans futurs. Et 30 années avant aujourd'hui. Tu pouvais trouver que l'eau coulait dans ces cours d'eau. Aujourd'hui, regardez, l'eau ne coule plus. So as we're learning, the site the 4K has chosen is on the large Ponga River in a coastal wetland. But with changes in rainfall, there could be changes to come in 4K's habitat over the coming decade. We're also learning that that change in rainfall isn't just an issue for here in Guinea, because actually Guinea is the water source for three main rivers that feed most of West Africa. Well, that's it from here in Sussex, but don't forget you can get all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app. We will be back, but not for three weeks. We're taking a little Easter break back on April the 22nd. See you then. <laughs>